Good morning and Merry Christmas to everyone out there. Welcome to Deadline TV. Uh, we're going to turn around to a series of very short little videos today. They're all interrelated, um, so if some things you don't understand, then maybe just go and review some of the other videos, you might find some of it um, fell on the loose. Or just Facebook me and ask me some questions, because I'm always very approachable on that front as well. Um, again, if you want to know where I'm coming from, um, just go on to my website, which is all my, you know, who I've done and what I've done all about. Put a few books, put out a few newspapers, but, you know, I said this is not about that, this is about... Today we're going to be talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Yes, it has another different al set of alphabet numbers, uh, names, but we all know this is TPA, so let's just call it that and, and be done with it. Uh, on December the, the 30th of this year, um, basically the final reading, which basically leads to the ratification of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement will be passed through, and then, in theory, we're stuck with that for the next 75 years. Uh, ratification is a step further than signing something. So ratification is kind of like the bit where you say, oh, you know, are you sure, are you sure, are you absolutely sure, and then once you find it, then you, you kind of, it is the done deal. Uh, although, in saying that, the point of this, this video is that I don't believe it actually is a done deal, because there's steps, uh, things which have been addressed, which our government actually needs to. Because our government sometimes is a little bit slack at beginning it, that rule book doesn't just apply to us, it actually applies to them as well. Now, the, the, the issue of this all boils down to the, the very thorny subject of constitutionalism. Um, and that's basically the, the thing which protects our rights and says, you know, we, we all know, the, the, you know, we the people, blah, 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 America, but we have that in England, and sorry, New Zealand as well, uh, it's because we're part of a Westminster system. In fact, basically all governments, regardless of Republicanism, Communism, or whatever, they work on a set template, which is you have your, your executive, you have your judiciary, you have your um, legislative, uh, um, legislative branch, and these things are all tied together by a series of mechanics and, and um, well, for want of a word, a bit of glue, uh, which is often a, a collection of different institutions or symbols. So in the Westminster system, in fact, all the governments, but that, that defines uh, the flag, your head of state, the currency you use, coat of arms, these are all things which tie the, the theoretical concept of a government together and actually say, right, this is, this is that. In New Zealand, it says our system is based on the Westminster system, um, what we are called is we're a constitutional monarchy, um, which basically means that you have to go all the way back 800 years ago, when kings were running around cutting each other's heads off and, and a bunch of people thought, well, in England, this is not very good. So they literally dragged their local king out by sword point, a bunch of barons, and said, sign this thing called the Magna Carta, and um, ever since that's been basically our, our founding block of where really democracy comes. Now, the actual Magna like, Carta has over 800 years. It's changed all, over 14 times. But the one significant thing, which is very important to us in New Zealand and this whole issue of the TPA, is what we call Article 29. This deals with the whole right like, of our, our rights to, of to rights, our rights to justice, our rights to be reviewed by our peers. Just go again, Google it, it's very simple if you want the word for word wording. And that word for word wording hasn't changed in 800 years, mostly because that little thing when you keep reading through, it starts to say, and no man shall have his laws out, um, and no man shall have his rights outlawed. That's the key wording we're looking at here. It's basically this document and this clause was written for specific purposes that we're facing today, which is we don't want some tyrant coming along down the road and using some quick legalised mumble jumbo to do away with the rights. So they wrote this thing in that clause to, to be entrenched and to be protected. Now, in New Zealand, uh, the last time I looked, in 1998, we, we passed through a series of legislations which explained why various parts of, of our, what we call appeal decrees or appeal charters, which, which is what Article 29 is part of, why they are law. Now, a lot of these have been removed, and again, this goes back to the wider issue, because what's been going on is it's not just that we're going to deal with article issues. It's all these, these symbols and institutions which actually make up our Westminster system in New Zealand have been slowly dismantled bit by bit so that it can actually change the kind of nature of the kind of government we are or if we want the kind of vehicle we're driving and make it a different base. Ba and, and if they can do it, then that means that the TPA will become legal. We'll get into that in a little bit second. But in New Zealand, you know, those significant changes, and it's, it's, it's the key thing here is these changes are the collective changes. Quite often my critics have tried to come out and have single me and have liked me and say, oh no, no, Blade's got nothing to do with this. Well, for each of these things by themselves, no, but collectively they do. So in New Zealand what happened was we got rid of our Supreme Court, sorry, our Privy Council, we changed it to the Supreme Court. This is now a court that's actually picked by, the, the judges are picked by the politicians, not by the, uh, the Lord Laws. 
so it, it's moved that system and forward into, out into the state, not the Crown, two different entities. The Crown ties up to that whole institutional bridge that we are part of the Westminster system. So we've now moved our courts into the state as opposed to being part of the Crown system. We then turn around and what we're also doing is we're, we're slowly getting rid of, we're making changes to book. Remember how I said a lot of these things are actually quite symbolic? Very important to read up on the rules in Parliament which explain this stuff, but basically in our currency what we're doing is we're slowly but surely removing the monarchy. Now, at the moment you reach into your wallet, you've got a little green one, $20. That's the only one that's got Queen Elizabeth's name on it at the moment, and I imagine when she passes away we, we're going to see that gone. And there'll be one more institute which removes us away from this Westminster system. Again, it's been very interesting because um, over the last two years, um, the Treasury put out very subversive um, statements saying, oh, we're putting out new money and it's going to have all these things and it explains all these things I'm saying to you about how, you know, these aren't just bits of paper, they're actually part of a wider thing. And they make direct reference to the reason why we have civil to the Crown within our, our Crown. Now, it's interesting because in the OMI, I don't know what they're going to be doing, we're not going to do this, well, they, they, they get very, very uh, vague or evasive. But the end with the hindsight point is each time we're seeing slowly but surely it's not just the, the, off the, the, the Queen's sister, off the surface, all those little embedded notes where she used to be hiding, no, she's dug on there as well. So that's the secondary thing. In 2013, we, uh, we also had another thing called the Constitutional Review, which is looking at a, a, a series of, of a whole bunch of changes, including the changes of here the state. Now this, this document, Jane Kelsey became probably the most authorised person on the TPA said, oh no, we need to be paying attention to the Constitutional Review. Now, it's very, very important to the whole issue of the TPA and the pieces down the road. This document, a very, very, very significant bit of body of work designed to be a public conversation, uh, conversation with us, saying what, what we want, supposedly, run just like the flag uh, road shows where they went out and basically didn't tell anyone they were there so that they could be seen to be giving public consultation, but not. But it doesn't even include the Magna Carta within it. And this, this is this is really, I mean, you go on, again, you go online and start reading about the Magna Carta and last year was its 800th anniversary. Everyone will tell you, this is the most significant document of, dem of, of democracy and constitutionalism. So to have a constitutional review of conversation where you're not actually talking about that is just strange in anyone's book. So we did that, you know, that aspect. And of course, I'll we'll follow one other point to that was that uh, when they, they the, the review uh, did its findings, all you know, hand-picked panel people, some of them actually also people on the flag panels, for example, like Peter Chin got $650 a day for sitting on both, but they gave their recommendations, and uh, the, the, civil, um, uh, the, the Civil Liberty Society turned around and said to them, well, well, you know, how do you feel about their responses? The government, under an unofficial information act, which they're kind of obliged to, uh, you know, answer the law, turned around and didn't say anything. So again, an another example of the slowly but orchestrated system that moved us from the Westminster system. I got a lot of flack over this. Uh, one of the things was I wrote a thing called Due Authority. Um, Andrew Giddies, who was a professor of law at Tuggy University, got up on national TV. I think there was about 20 newspaper radio articles that say, no, 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 Due Authority is all rubbish. He said, oh, no, no, Due Authority is uh, probably a made up word. Uh, again, guys, go out and Google the wiki, the wiki um, the uh, PD version there, it's a good very good thing from Black Law, explains very much that no due authority is very much a process. Where they got it wrong was I wouldn't say the flag is due authority, I was saying it's a symbol of due authority, this process of all of these things like our currency, our coat of arms, our flag, what they basically heraldically represent is, you know, who's the boss and what the rank is. So when our knight goes onto the battlefield, he's got a shield there, it's got, you know, Sybil's in the mark that he's a baron or a viscount or whatever, it's got, you know, who his boss is on top of it. The, the, those are the symbols, and that's what was basically happening when I was trying to do the flag debate. It was one more thing where I was just trying to remove that reference of, the, of a, our tie to Western system off our actual flag. Um, I said again, they had a tie to the, to the Magna Carta, and the game was told, no, 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 that's not, not true. Um, three, three quick footnotes on that one. Um, if you go to Australian Parliament, uh, they have the, the Magna Carta hangs up there. The, the history is very easy to find again online. It tells you how in 1877 convicts petitioned uh, England said, look, we're sick and tired of being pushed around by um, squatters, you know, the, what I call the pre TPPA. Uh, we want English law. So as a, as, a, as a celebration of that fact, that's why they put the Union Jack on the Australian flag. And that's why they had the Magna Carta up in the foyer of Canberra, which is, you know, so you want to say that that wasn't tied to the Magna Carta, just simply doesn't know the history. Likewise, it, it, up until this whole issue became very public, 
it used to say very categorically under the you know what the hieroglyph symbol of the uh, Union Jack on the flag was. It said was well, it's a, a symbol of our democratic traditions. Um, a lot of them also was the flag of England. No, it's not. It's the Commonwealth symbol. Uh, symbol. It represents the crown. And, and as I try to get a point, try to get through the crown and the nation are actually quite different entities. I'm not a big royalist myself, but in this particular case, the Magna Carta and the Article 29 is very, very important. And this is even what you know, Sir Geoffrey Palmer has said previously that you can't have a new constitutional arrangement without an actual Magna Carta, or some a, a clause of that is of equivalent. Fast forward. The whole point of this, and again, funny enough, it was because Guinness is known there's no due authority. Later on, he was one of these sort of academics who turned around to actually know the TPA is a constitutional issue. He even cites Article 29 in there, saying, no, no, actually, um, this is one of the reasons why it's you know not constitutional. Basically, it boils down to is that the TPA is going to be creating its own tribunal system with these clauses in it, which we'll come to in a second, which, if allowed, will basically supersede the court of our land and do away with Article 29. So it's, it's a direct breach of Article 29. We had this huge fight. Everyone said yes, no, we didn't. Lots of more and more people came on board saying, oh, actually, this is a constitutional issue. No one was really explaining why. I think I was the only one who really actually explained the Article 29 factor. It was actually, luckily for us, that it was the indigenous people of, of Canada that came forth at the very last moment and said, basically, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, well, you, you can't actually sign a TPA if it's going to include these uh, investment uh, state dispute settlements. I always get a little bit dyslexic. I think it's, um, that I've got that correct. Sometimes it's more ISSD, but we all know what, you know, it's those little nasty ISSD calls or ISDS clauses. And that's where the matter ended. They had to put a suspension on them because guess what? That it was a constitutional issue. We're now moving forward to a system, however, where it's, it's really important, however, that we keep, keep addressing this issue because even though we've ratified it, those clauses haven't been removed. They've simply been suspended. The murderer has been told to take his bullets out of the gun, but instead of throwing the bullets away, he's just put them in his pocket. What I believe will happen is in the next phase is that we'll probably see the return of America into the TPA. This will be see the reactivation of the clauses. In the meantime, basically what they've got to turn around and do is they've got to change the entire system of New Zealand so that we now fit them legally so that they can actually get away this little skullduggery. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's going to be really interesting because, as I said, Article 29 is pretty clear. It, it's it's self-contained. You can't just write it out. The, the trick behind all of this, boys and girls, is, is the concept of acquiescence. All laws work like this. You know, at the end of the day, uh, Margaret Wilson, who's the former Attorney General, said, you know, we've had 25 years of governments chipping away at our checks and balances, doing passing laws that they can't because of our constitutional mechanics. But they get away with it because acquiescence is based upon what you know and what you think. And if, if your opponent can get you to think something else, then he can get away with it. And guess what? That's kind of how the law works. And it's, it's just a big kind of uh, wordsmith game. So if we can turn around and be publicly aware that this sort of thing is there, hammer it actually home, then it's going to get very, very tight because that's really what they're waiting for. They're waiting for us to forget. You know, or that they can change the system. The second thing is that you know, there are moves at the moment, which, which you know, I'll be going into, um, the next, the next thing that I'll be coming along is they're trying to redefine the whole issue of what rights actually are. This goes into bigger issues, for example, the whole UN migration policy. Um, we'll treat that as a separate situation. But that's where we're at at the moment, is that the TPA, yes, it's signed, but it, it, how it can be signed is a really strange situation because it's got these clauses in it which still actually in breach of our existing laws. And that's it. You've got to remember, this is part of our law, and that law is quite entrenched. Um, so go away and have a little bit of a think about that. If, in terms of what I think the solutions are, is one is keeping that noise up, two being aware that, that you know, as far as them getting their final end game, they're still planning and plotting, so we need to be aware of what the second phase is, which is what my second vote, um, um, video, the, the, the Road to Washington, is all about. And um, we also need to have a look at this issue of in terms of, you know, what basically TPA really, really works on at the end of the day is the assumption that they, that the corporates that can go into a law, into a, into a tribunal, they've fixed the game, they've got an army of lawyers, and they can simply act basically be us with deeper pockets and, and larger force. Well, I believe that there are actually existing tools available, and we'll be looking at some of those as well, such as class actions, which allow us to play to our advantage, which is we have the number, we have the public awareness, and you know, if we can, act, our really our biggest enemy is apathy. And we need to be beating out there and being passionate and being aware of 
we get the government at the end of the day that we actually deserve. And if we choose to let them to ignore it, then, then they're going to have this. Uh, going to have it all their way. But if we believe that actually we care about a society, then yes, we can make those changes. Thank you very much for watching the very first of our Deadline TV series, and um, hopefully um, you keep watching more. Thank you very much.